Hello and welcome to In Search of Purpose with Sal Hamby. Welcome everybody to today's podcast. I'm Sal Hamby, your host, and we are In Search of Purpose. Today we are In Search of Purpose with Keith Golden, an amazing, amazing man with a lot to tell. I would like to hand you over to Keith to say hi. Hello, nice to be here. Thank you very much, Sal. Not at all. Thank you for coming on, Keith. Keith, I met you, we were trying to work it out there uh, about 16, I thought it was 15, 16 years ago. So um, it's been a very long time since you and I have actually seen each other. It was back in London uh, when I was working um, on the Top of the Pops music researcher for the BBC. And you were in London uh, doing some gigs, uh, playing bass for Dido. Can you tell us a little bit about that to start with? About playing with Dido? Yeah, just how we met in that situation, what you were doing at that time. Yeah, so um, that would have been my second world tour with Dido. Um, And we spent a lot of time in London since she was London-based. So we rehearsed there, and then obviously she had a big fan base there, but it was really sort of our European home. Uh, So due to the fact that I was there for weeks on end at a time, I got to make friends with people like you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was great fun. <laughs> I remember us going to, uh, which is not my thing at all, if anybody knows me, but mm. um, I we went to the end nightclub in mm-hmm. to see Ronnie Size. Yep, yep, uh, that's right. Yeah, on Easter yeah. Sunday. I can remember. <laughs> and this is a really, really strange way to be spending Easter Sunday, but I'm going with it because we're in London and, you know, I'm out, I'm out for a night out with Keith Golden. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a good time. We did have a good time. So, um, first of all, uh, tell us a bit about your background and, and how you get into doing what you did before I met you. Well, as a kid, I was fascinated by music, Um, piano lessons, guitar lessons, drum lessons. I taught myself how to play bass and um, eventually moved to New York City to be a bass player um, after making the rounds, uh, doing different sessions, um, caught on with the Dido uh, tour in 1999. And how did you get on to that? I mean, did you have to audition for that or how did that work? Yeah, I was recommended by a friend uh, to audition and uh, we hit it off like I, I was in the first group to come in that day and she she later mentioned that like just the energy that I brought into the room uh, and some things that we said to each other um, made an impression there so you came into the audition in waves of bands so I was in a band that auditioned the next band that was due to come in didn't have a bass player so she asked me if I wanted to stay and play with the next band. I said, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, uh, pretty much in after that. That was great. And what year was that? Uh, 19, uh, this would have been early 1999. 1999. Okay. So I think that we met in 2001 or two or something like that. So you were kind of already planned for, say, two or three years prior to when we met. Would that be about right? Um, well, I did two tours, and I think that we met on the second tour, but I could be mistaken. Yeah, 2004, I think we were saying there. So, yeah. Yeah. Second one. So, yeah. So, that was right, because I think you played the Academy. That's right. Mm-hmm. And I, went, I went to that gig. That's right. That was that yeah. were fun, fun times when you could be in London without, like, a lot of madness going on, very relaxed at that time. Um, it was a combination. Um, I, I have memories of being in hotel rooms and uh, just feeling peace and calm and appreciation for the whole experience. Um, but then, you know, you play shows and there's the energy in the audience. Uh, so it had a, a good mix of energy um, that I really appreciated being a part of. And what was the um, the biggest, uh, or what was the biggest capacity gig that you played with her? Um, we played at the Live Eight concert in Hyde Park, and that was however many hundred thousand or something. That's right. Um, and yeah, and then we did the V Festival, uh, I think, in two different locations, and uh, that was about sixty thousand. Once it gets that big, it's just it's 
it's so many people it doesn't even look like people um but it's yeah. still quite an experience yeah i know i can i can imagine i um then after i think you, you played as well um for a while after that have you played with anybody else um well i, I continued to play music for another six years um Probably nobody whose name rings any bells as prominently as Dido, but uh, yeah, I kept playing for a little while there. And that went on then. So if I met you in 2004, you played on for about another six after that. So it was about 2000. Yeah, probably, yeah, 2011, I think, is when I, uh, that's when I stopped, uh, that's when I left New York, and that's when I stopped seeking gigs, and then I still played. There was a couple of bands that I really liked, and I would fly back to New York to play with them. Um, but beyond that, I stopped pursuing music in 2011. And did you enjoy New York or were you glad to sort of move out of it or did it just serve its purpose at the time? Are you a city seeker? No. <laughs> I was, when I was a kid and I moved there, the adventure and the adrenaline all were the same language that I was feeling in my body and in my spirit. Um, and then the fact that New York opened a gateway to play music in the way that I was interested in pursuing was exciting. Uh, touring was exciting. Um, but then eventually there was aspects of it that, um, like when I actually, when I did the 2004 tour, um, there was a period where we did it, usually you travel by night, but there was a little period where we traveled by day and it happened to be in the UK. And we would be driving through like countrysides and I would see women hanging their clothes on the clothesline and then just really simple calm life and uh it just started to resonate you know and then i remembered how colorful and beautiful some of the buildings were um uh, and then even beyond the uk like other cities that we went to um it just something about the that that experience started to change my thinking and then when i came back to new york it just looked like bricks and ugliness and dirt and um, so after 2004, I, I bought a place in Jersey City, which is a little bit less of a city crush, um, just about 10 minutes away from New York, right across the river. Um, but eventually, uh, just city life didn't really speak to me as much, um, and the nature of the music business as well. Uh, so I moved to Florida, where there was a lot of nature and space and, and uh nature just I can, I can i can say nature over and over and over it was just peaceful Lovely. and then after yeah after a couple of years there i came back to baltimore where i'm from and same i just you know it's just I mean, i'm in a city right now but it's not the same like crush of the city and i'm in a different line of work so uh this this lifestyle resonates with me more now and probably you know a, aside from pursuing music this is really like what my life is is meant to be about well that's that would um is what i want to talk to you about uh, so what exactly is it that you've moved into and why i've moved into serving people and uh, what i do is uh help people learn how to move better um whether they're top athletes helping them to understand their joints better or heal from injuries better or whether they're grandparents helping them be able to lift their grandkids uh, deep into their 90s. You know, I want people to stay active. And so either it's joint mobility work or breath work or calisthenics or yoga, or whatever it is, um, that's, that's what I do now. And I chose it. Um, it felt like when I played music, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of it as a musician, but as I started to transition out, felt like it was just always about me um and the ego you know so yeah because it is you know, you, you know you have to have ego to play music but it can overtake you but i suppose if you're serving others then you're stripping of the ego aren't you to a certain extent yeah um that can be complicated um There's definitely an aspect of music that, as I experienced it, where um, ego could play a part. Um, but that can also happen when people are, I mean, I, I know some egocentric yoga teachers. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> this is very, very true. <laughs> so it's really like, what is your, um, and I'm, you know, I have, I, we all, 
ego helps us stay alive to a certain degree. Ego is what motivates you to eat, what motivates right. you to do your job. So, um, but there's a healthy aspect to uh, wanting to serve people and make people feel better. And sometimes music can have that aspect. But I've found that if you're really looking at the person in front of you, like if I said, hey, Sal, what's going on? And you said my shoulder. And I'm like, cool. Like I might want to, in my personal practice, I might want to do a whole bunch of stuff that's like tearing up shoulders and doing really aggressive stuff. But if I'm serving you, then it's like, okay, cool. Let's see what's going on with your shoulder and starting with a gentle approach to see how you, your shoulder is moving. So in that point, it's like, I'm always serving. So it doesn't matter what song that was in my head that day that might not be right for you. It's always an opportunity to just be there available to help people. Well, that's amazing. And did you start pretty much doing that straight away, 2011, 2012? Nah, I spent uh, two years just um, uh, in the parachute. <laughs> yeah, re reconnecting with yourself to find out where you were going next. Yeah, for okay. sure. Good. It took a minute and then... Um, it hit a place where I realized I'm completely finished with music, but I have no idea what I want to do. And I went to a great uh, therapist uh, uh, who, she asked me to write down what I wanted my life to be about. And I wrote, I think I still have this piece of paper and I wrote down that I wanted to, I had no background in sports other than being a sports fan. And I used to read a lot of books by coaches and stuff, but I wrote down that I wanted to train athletes, but I had no idea. I didn't graduate college. I didn't take a biology class since 10th grade in school, like just nothing. But my ambition was somehow to help people be better at being athletic. And so I wrote it down and I was like, I don't even know what that means. And at that point I was still thinking maybe I'll be a photographer, maybe I'll go back to college, like just clueless. Um, but then uh, about four to six months after that, I signed up to take a college yoga class at a community college. And I just, I took one class and I took the class just because I hated school, man. Like I hated college when I dropped out however many years ago. So Snap. I was like, if I, what? Snap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so when I took the class, it was to see let, if I can exist in the academic environment, a yoga class, with, and it was philosophy of yoga, not just postures. So you had to do written work. I'm going to take this class to see if it resonates. And if I can get it do this class, maybe I'll have a chance in a science class, you know? Well, the class was a game changer. At the same time, I was practicing in the studio with a friend who I had known for 30 years. She owned the studios. Um, and I explained to her I was considering being a teacher because um, I, you know, I had a decent practice by then. And she was really encouraging of it. My college teacher was also encouraging. And uh, that's when it really, like 20, early 2014, everything really started to pick up in that direction. Um, but there was a time in 2013, you know, three months before that, like say September, where I first connected with the friend who owned, it, owned the yoga studio. And I remember being on her couch and I can't remember how the conversation got to this place, but, and this is still when I have zero direction and uh, my direction was just peace and like hiking a lot and, you know, reclaiming myself. And I started crying on her couch and saying that I wanted to dedicate my life to love. And, you know, like, <laughs> like if you would have, if you if I would have seen a video like five years before of me on the couch saying that, I would have been like, what went wrong? Like what, what happened? Why are you doing that? But really but was, now you're saying you know what went right. Yeah, exactly. Like in that moment it was like part of the coming out, you know. And um and so here I am. And that's uh so that was that was the biggest transition was coming back here. I moved in with my dad. He has a beautiful house uh, in a state park, you know, nature all around. And just having the peace and the calm around me helped me uh, hear the right voices in my head. Okay. And is that where you are now with your dad? No, I left him. Um, I moved into a place in the city uh, away from the park. So I left him about three and a half years ago. But, you know, we see each other a lot. But... Uh, being with him enabled me to figure out what direction I wanted. And he understood that I'm not an office guy. I'm, you know, he's an academic. My mother was an academic and they knew that their only son was just like, I hate school. And so 
uh, fortunately, he gave me the opportunity to figure out what do I want to do next. And then once I found this path, uh, he was really supportive throughout. And That's I wouldn't brilliant. leave without that. It's really, really good. What's the um, population density of Baltimore now? Uh, I think we're at like 900,000 or something like that. Pretty big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. I'm 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 in a very chill neighborhood in the city. Um, but there's minimal high rises. Uh, the energy of the city is still real. Um, and I am looking forward to moving into a more relaxed place. At the time when I moved here, I had a lot of classes in the city, thinking about gas mileage and stuff like that in Central. I teach at seven different studios. So was, this is like a central location to get to all the places. Of course, um, yeah. So are you, are you just wanting to move more burbs? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's there's communities that just there's just great nature all around. Um, so it's not so much the neighborhood as it is proximity to nature. Exactly. Um, I live quite near the sea, and sometimes it's funny. I'm I'm really close to it. You're talking like two hundred yards, maybe two hundred mm -hmm. feet. Mm -hmm. and um there's a, literally a wall if you're upstairs you can see the sea but if you're downstairs it's, it's like a walled garden so you can't see the sea um mm -hmm. and just to, you think to yourself like you're you're bound to be breathing in the sea air mm -hmm. you're not smelling the sea and then every now and again it must be when the tide's really low and the air is blowing a certain way it literally mm -hmm. you're on the beach mm -hmm. wow so it's really wow. lovely it really is That's and great. You know, I lived, I, when I met you, I, I don't know, like, I mean, did you think I was a city flyer? Because I really was convinced that I was a city flyer. Did, <laughs> did you kind of look at me and go, she's a country bumpkin, she'll get there in the end. <laughs> hey, I just, I saw you as exploring your possibilities. Oh, that's a good answer. Uh, I'll give you your payment at the end for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I really was. I mean, it was, I was a jet-setting, highfalutin, London Cosmo girl gone wrong. <laughs> Just being totally honest. I, I, I thought I liked the, I liked the idea of, of being in London and living in London and the reality of being there and the illusion of what you expected is entirely different. Mm -hmm. And I am a soul searcher, not a soul sucker. So mm -hmm. it just did not serve any part of my soul whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt it was awful. I, I mean, I understand maybe some people want to live there and their job suits them well, and I'm not putting anybody down for living in London, but it's just for not for some people. And I'm definitely mm -hmm. one of those people. It took me to do that, to realize mm -hmm. how much I didn't want that. I suppose, mm. like many, many things in life when you're searching for something specific. Um, mm. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, with your career, because with mine, uh, you know, I've, I've written an album myself. I've done some really great gigs. You know, I suppose the biggest ones would have been with Jules Holland on his UK and Irish, Irish tour. I did the Irish leg of the UK and Irish tour with him about four or five years ago. Really amazing experience. Played in front of thousands of people. Exactly the same. Wrote my own album, everything else. but I now just play for fun mm. and I really appreciate that much more because I could have pursued it. I could have driven it. I could have done it, but I just really, you know, it didn't serve my soul. It's just another one of those situations where I just felt like, um, you know, the more likes you had on Facebook was obviously more important. And I just find that really terrible. And I often thought maybe if I had a bean of Joan Baez or, you know, Joni Mitchell's era, you know, where likes weren't appropriate. It was just, you know, you got a record deal and you worked really hard mm -hmm. and you toured loads and you made loads of albums about one a year. I mean, that's obviously what I would have preferred to be doing rather than putting my music out for free in the hope that I get a following. The mm -hmm. whole consensus of what it started to represent to me was just uh, meaningless, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You know, and then I, like you, you know, I, I always, the uh, thing is, I actually made my album while I was doing my therapies because I, as people know, I'm a reflexologist, acupuncturist, and nutritional therapist. So it's naturopathic work I do. You know, I'm dealing more with the, I'm not saying that you're not, but you're more about um, obviously working with them physically as well as mentally and spiritually. I understand the connection, but with me, it's more about their um, their lifestyle, their diet, and their attitude. I'm working on them energetically with regards to 
different modalities of traditional Chinese medicine and so on. So essentially I'm serving mm -hmm. like you're serving in a way that is much more fulfilling for them and me. You know, I just think that uh, it's really interesting how the two of us have almost went down very similar but different paths regarding looking for purpose. And I mean, that's the whole point and purpose of these podcasts is, you know, to, to just to speak to people, find interesting stories about their lives, where they, where they started, where they've, where they've went and where they are now and how that serves them purpose, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and I think it's great. How are you coping with the lockdown with regards to the work side of things? Are you adapting well? Um, yeah, I'm, I've been uh, fortunate for the internet and uh, I teach classes. I'm teaching 10 classes a week. Um, I, yeah, it's been, uh, I mean, just to, to say up front, like, I understand people are suffering, so I'm not going to be all like, you know, but we also all live our own lives. And if I had had a baby this week, I'd be thrilled about having a baby this week. And it feels like these classes that I've been teaching at home are a new baby in my life. And it's really exciting to be able to interact through Zoom and see people in their homes, to see people practicing with their pets. Like the main thing that I always say in my classes, have a home practice. Don't just go to class once a week. Don't just go to class five times a week. You should be able to practice at home. Like I might teach you 60 minutes this movement sequence, but maybe that's not addressing Sal's shoulder. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And yeah. You know that your shoulder needs work, but you have to take five, 10 minutes at home. And now I see people practicing at home. <laughs> and yeah. It might be all we have, but maybe it's a new practice, a new habit that you'll have and you'll remember like how valuable it was to create some space wherever you have it next to your bed or whatever it is. Um, so to be a part of that right now, and to be able to continue teaching, um, I feel lucky and uh, blessed by the opportunity and look forward to life returning to normal. But it's an honor when people say that the class is like keeping them sane or the class is bringing them joy or when we're all up on the screen and people see familiar faces or new faces or just faces, uh, recognizing that people are lonely. Um, and just being a part like i just wanted to teach just because that's what i do all these other things that i just mentioned i had no idea would be a part of it and i'm thrilled that we have this opportunity yeah i mean just the fact that you're able to obviously the contact with person to person in a um in a one-to-one -one or in a same room environment obviously is the is the ideal uh, mm -hmm. you're having to adapt you know yourself in order to work in with what's happening now um, and it's great that a lot of people can actually do that whereas for the likes of myself because I'm a touch therapist in the sense that it's very hands-on with reflexology and acupuncture mostly it's difficult to adapt and modify albeit some nutrition online consultations are going on um, you know, when it comes to the fact that you are able to do what you do from home and still get satisfaction out of what, the, what it is that you do, um, can you explain a wee bit about the certain things that you might be doing with your clients from home? Yeah, uh, we move <laughs> very athletically. <laughs> and um, in the beginning, uh, I perceived that people would be sitting around a lot. And so I just wanted some more like slow movements to get spine and hips and shoulders moving. And, but my classes are in before all of this are tend to be more vigorous. And so I had people, uh, I said, you know, give me some feedback and let me know how classes are serving. And they said, we're not moving like in our lives. We're just sitting all day. So if there's anything you can do to increase movement. So then I started having people um, just walk around their house in awkward positions, like squat around your house for a minute, come back to the computer in a minute or walk do downward facing dog and walk around your house and down wow. and they're just like yes yes more stuff <laughs> more stuff so it's that um there's still stretching involved there's always breathing exercises and there's always meditation and i had you know i didn't i didn't really teach meditation very much in my classes in the five years i had been teaching um but i started to regularly about three weeks before the quarantine because i recognized that we're about I, it seems like we're on the way to being quarantined and you should know how to sit still 
you should be able to master your thoughts and and it might you might not master them right away but practice it now and uh if not the quarantine then the cancer is going to come or the stroke is because something is going to happen to all of us where we're on the deathbed and if you've learned how to be calm with quarantine or with being stuck in an elevator you'll have a better chance of keeping your stress rate down and living a good life um and so the meditation has continued through um uh, through so every session is breathing in the beginning pretty rigorous activity and then some joint mobility work and then some meditation at the end it sounds ideal um you know people again know me for contacting me regarding you know best way of getting certain vitamins into their system uh, elimination diets with regards to food intolerances and, and allergies and uh, looking at ways to create hormone balance within the system. You know, these are my areas of forte, but I will be the first to say that I am really always very confused and overwhelmed by exercise the right way. Mm. Um, you know, just even to touch a wee bit on that, um, I've dabbled in meditation on and off throughout my entire life, even from the age of 12. I, I remember my friend who was 15, I really looked up to her. And she had this book and I read it about meditation when I was 12. And I was, I was trying to do it when I was 12 years old it, with, with, no, with no guidance, no group, no nothing, just me and my book and my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I do meditation at the minute. The one that I'm, I'm working on is the Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra 21 mm -hmm. Days um, of Hope, which is really mm -hmm. brilliant. Because some people need a guided meditation, really, you know, to keep them motivated. Some just like the silence and to be able to try and channel in on their own. So, you know, I sort of dip in and out of those different ways of doing it. But I find then I come to do the stretches and I think, right, should I go on the treadmill or go in the garden for a walk? Or should I stretch first before I do that? Because they say, oh, well, if you just walk walk on the treadmill or outside and um, you know and get a bit of stretch go with a bit of warmth that is like doing your stretches and then the importance is the stretches at the end so can you actually is that right is that right yes. Good. <laughs> because Absolutely. yeah because i was kind of for a while doing exercises doing stretches first and thinking i'm not warmed up here mm -hmm. i'm i'm trying to stretch and and you know cold muscle mm -hmm. you know yeah. i think You're it's yeah, I thought I was sort of maybe going to do some injury to my groin if I hadn't have done my stretches before I did my walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the best is to move. Uh, you could do gentle stretches, but like you said, you're not warmed up. Um, and so if you just, you know, get your body moving. So like, let's say you plan to run. I wouldn't start sprinting right away. Your warm up should be jogging, you know, and then building up to if you're going to sprint or if you're going to run five miles, take the first half mile at a decent clip and then ramp it up but then stretching at the end is you know it, just on a side note sometimes if you stretch before you do your activity you kind of like soften the muscle and you don't want your muscle to be soft or your body to be soft when you're going to do something like if you're about to pick up let's say you had to pick up a crate of books you want to be like burr, burr. Like you okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if you've stretched first, you're kind of soft and injuries can happen off of that. So, but if you do your work and then you stretch afterwards and your body, your body sees it as like, I did the work and now here's the gratitude and the stretching is like, Hey, thanks. Thanks. It's like getting a massage at the end of the day. You yeah, that's, get a really, that's a really good way of looking at it. And I wish I had have known that I'm nearly 40 years old and I'm only there. <laughs> I'm only getting that clarified right now. And it makes more sense, you know, because you'll have lots of different people from lots of different walks of life telling you lots of different theories. But that, to me, is the one that makes sense the most. Um, mm -hmm. so thanks for that, Keith. Um, Pleasure. What's your plan next? I mean, have you uh, decided to continue doing what you're doing? Is by going online something that you think that you're going to incorporate in when the normal comes back or what? Yeah, well, I teach at studios as an employee, and I will continue to do that once. And I'm still teaching for them online as well as independently. Uh, I will continue to teach for them once studios are back open. Uh, but the great thing about 
the way that I'm doing the online classes is there's people who I used to teach who've moved away and now we can practice again. And that's something I plan to continue for sure. So uh, I'll get back in the studio and working with live people. I mean, like you, it, it's different when you can touch people and, you know, be face to face and really experiment and see what's going on uh, with their bodies. Yeah. And, you know, we touch differently, but it's like, if I, if I'm, trying to get make sure somebody's doing their shoulder rotation right and i can just see each time they're leaning and i can just hold their body and say now do it and then they see like oh i have to be out here and not up here so it's just things like that where i look forward to being back physical with people um and just feeling the vibe and the energy in the room uh, and being able to motivate people and feel what's right for the room at any given time uh, but I will continue online for sure. Uh, it's been great to reconnect. I mean, I have one guy who's practicing in Hawaii, which is <laughs> like <laughs> across the Pacific Ocean, you know, and it's been great to connect with him again. So uh, he's just one of many that are not in the area, and I'm really thankful for it. It sounds good. I, I think as well for me personally, I, I find that I've learned, you know, totally honest, I'm learning to trust myself more with not having the, oh, I'll go to class, I'll go to Pilates, I'll go to such and such, oh, they'll, they'll start me out, oh, I'll go to physio, oh, I'll go, you know, it's that kind of um, getting back to, you know, self-trust in yourself, working through things that you always sort of searched for out there, that's my personal experience, but I really like this idea of what you're doing, you know, because it's like a mentor, um, but yet you have to have trust in yourself to be able to know what, what you're doing rather than have this dependable reliance on somebody else. It's nice. 100%, yeah, a hundred percent. And, and I mean, I like, sometimes I go so hard in class telling students, like, I still want you to come to class. <laughs> like, like I appreciate what we do and you might get ideas from me, but like be responsible for yourself, you know? And, and fortunately my, my the woman who trained me in being a teacher kim manfredi as well as the woman who taught me in college helen heifer they both were adamant about home practice and and uh instilling in us as teachers like if you're not practicing on your own as a teacher then what are you teaching and exactly uh, yeah so then but then also like with heifer she was she was teaching us as college students be responsible for your butt like so when we did our homework you had to practice three times a week at least in the start of the semester three times a week at home at least 15 minutes no video and no yoga class it had to be 15 minutes what do you want to do and uh so having her teach these college kids the same way it's like oh if she's putting it on 18 year olds to be responsible then she's really saying everybody be responsible for yourself and i think that's a uh, extremely valuable exactly and it is a bit like that you know healer heal thyself you know you know that kind of uh practice what you preach because yeah. you know there, there is that kind of feeling of um you know i find that i only went to classes and then people um would say often the teachers like yourself which is so important you know practice at home it's a bit like going to a physiotherapist they work a bit on you, they give you exercises, you go away, you don't do it, you go back the next week, they say, how are you? You say, I'm still really bad. Did you do your exercises? No. Yeah. It's that kind of um, one-stop fix shop whereby people feel that you're going to do everything for them that they need and they don't really need to do the work. And what I find in this reverse sort of situational um, times that we find ourselves in is that the situation I'm in now is, is that... Um, because I don't have, I, I wasn't you know, going to the classes and then doing nothing at home. And now I'm doing it all at home with no classes. Uh, I'm just really, really grateful for the fact that I really think I've nailed this kind of trust with myself mm -hmm. to be able to do it more at home. But I you know you might get another client out of this, Keith, and I might be giving you a shot. Come and get it. I would love to have you in practice. <laughs> uh, you say that <laughs> I'll be nah. asking you like a thousand questions and you'll be saying I, do another squat yeah. just do another squat <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so um, leaving that aside for a minute do you um, play the bass for fun anymore or are they all gone I tend to play twice a year 
Um, the most recent was uh, I had been out late at a dinner. I don't really hang out late anymore. I might stay up till midnight or one o'clock, but it's just I feel creative at night. But I stayed out celebrating a friend who was about to go to basic training. I got home. I had a lot of energy. And I just went on a YouTube binge. And it started with, um, I can't remember where it started. Where it ended was a 1983 live version of Life on Mars by David Bowie that I always loved and I always listened to. I just listened to it over and over and over the rest of the night. Friday, the next day, couldn't stop listening to Life on Mars, that particular version. And then Saturday, same thing. And I have my girlfriend, I'm like, yo, listen to this part, listen to this part. I taught a class that Saturday morning. I got home and I and she loves when I play bass. She didn't know me as a bass player. And I was like, I think I have to learn Life on Mars my own bass. And she's like, yay. <laughs> so I, I took my bass out and learned it. And then that usually leads to like 20 or 30 minutes of just playing through different bass lines that I've enjoyed or that I wanted to learn. And after 30 minutes, I'm good put the bass away and it'll be another six months before I pick it up again. Yeah, I know. I, I heard a really good analogy last week because my guitar, you know, it doesn't sit in this case, but it sits on its stand. Same idea, right? You're not picking it up. And someone said, it's like you put it into its coffin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's gone to the coffin now. And, yeah. You know, uh, and this, the weather's so beautiful. And, you know, I don't know if, if you're seeing a lot of ukulele, like, all of a sudden people are playing ukulele and they're coming out from mm. ukulele woodwork. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I keep feeling like I want to get my guitar back out, you know, of its coffin and mm. maybe go out into the garden and play a little song and, you know, and mm. probably will. And you might see it on social media. One of the <laughs> <look best>. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Cause I haven't played it in so long. Um, so whenever you were on tour, did you ever come to Ireland? I can't remember. Yeah, we played Dublin. Uh, I think we played Dublin once in 2001 and then again in 2004. Uh, but it was always a brief in and out overnight. Uh, we never, I don't, I think one night we stayed there the night before the show. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't spend a lot of time there. And you never went to Belfast, so you didn't? No, Ireland, I'm, Dublin is the only place I've been to in Ireland. Okay, well, you'll have to definitely change that. You and your partner can come over here, and my partner, Jack, he plays bass, so he'll love you. You'll get on like a house <laughs> floor. There's about three basses here at any one time, and they're not in coffins, so you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds delightful. I would love it. Thank yeah. you. Um, so whenever lockdown's over, Keith, is there a particular thing that you cannot wait to do? Uh, yeah, man, I, I'm looking forward to hugging my dad. Um, yeah, I've seen him a couple of times. He had computer issues and I went over and helped him fix it. Um, I brought him groceries and we always, like, I usually have lunch with him once every two weeks at the most, either once every week, or every two weeks. And it's always like a hug and a pound. And then at the end, a hug and a pound. And, uh, that is definitely the one thing that I'm looking to fix immediately um but fortunately he's in great health and he's happy to be home alone um he misses his girlfriend coming by uh, but every time i call him he just laughs about how bored he is and <laughs> that's, that's way better than i mean he's 82 years old and there's wow. a lot of people who are suffering so but yeah it's an easy answer i can't wait to see my dad what about you um, my mom um, is in the same situation, although she has asthma, so it's difficult for her. She she's staying home because it, she is sixty nine, so she's in that kind of bracket anyway. Um, she'll be seventy in June, so let's face it, she's in seventy bracket, but she's got asthma, so she's more respiratory compromised uh, than most to the point where it's just too risky. So pretty much the exact same scenario as yourself the massive hug and then to see my two wee dogs who are living with my mum who well there are dogs you know and um, so I'll really look forward to going and seeing my wee dogs and my mum and giving her a big hug and just cooking a dinner or going out for lunch or something like that that's it's just it just shows you how those are the things that we want most it's not that we take them for granted because exactly like you and your dad it's once once a week if not once a fortnight for a luncheon or a dinner exactly the same Keith so it's funny though how it's not that we take it for granted it's just that those are the things that matter the most you know 
they really are. I mean, you're, you know, yes, you might be looking forward to a concert or a restaurant or, you know, whatever, but those things, just the hug with your closest is the most important things. And it's funny because like I'm here in Northern Ireland and, you know, you kind of get a bit, you know, not insular, but, you know, cocooned in your own environment and reality. And, you know, you're literally 3000 miles away and your scenario is just the same as my scenario. And nobody is listening to this now thinking, is it really? Of course, we all understand that. Mm -hmm. But it's just a, it's reinforcing the significance of every single person is in the same situation at greater or better or worse degrees, really, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, it's, it's a trying time. There's no question about it. Um, but are you surviving in the house or are you, are you finding that you're going stir crazy? Or? Um, I mean, uh, I get along great with my girlfriend. Uh, very peaceful. Um, she's the easiest person to live with. My cats are great. Uh, the house is large. Uh, we have space. And I like to chill, man. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it'd be cool. To, we go hiking um, where there's, we pick the right time of day to go hiking where we barely see any people. We know the best trails to avoid people. Um, so, yeah, I don't feel, she probably feels they're crazy because she can't go to the gym and she likes to swim and stuff like that. Um, but I, I like calisthenics and yoga. So I just come up to the practice room right here and I'm good. So as long well, as they're I miss swimming, but uh, my hair doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> that. that is a chore. So is that your, your girlfriend I saw on social media who was closing the cupboard doors with her feet? Yes, that is her. <laughs> well done. She <laughs> wanted me to specifically mention to you her name is Caitlin O'Flaherty and how Irish her name <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Caitlin O'Flaherty. You are yes. absolutely kidding me. Okay, so every, every parent and every grandparent <laughs> and cousin and auntie are all from Ireland. Is that the case, Kate? At least on her father's side, that is the case. Um, okay, well, you have no excuse. You have to come over. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And I think that she went there with her brother, who's Ryan, uh, her twin brother, Ryan. And, uh, Ryan O'Flaherty? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I think they found some sort of family crest or something that was significant to them. Whereabouts? So, uh, Do you know whereabouts in Ireland? No, but I'll be sure to uh, email you and I'll put you guys in touch so you, she, she would love to interact with you. Um, Brilliant. That's so good. Yeah. Um, and it would I, be great to visit. I actually have a, a gym in the house. I've got mm -hmm. a rower, a really good concept rower. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I got like at an auction. Um, a spin bike, a treadmill and an elliptical. Mm, great. And then I've got a Reebok stepper loads mm -hmm. of dumbbells kettlebells uh, i've got like a wobble board i've got a trampoline rebounder i've got a gym mm -hmm. ball i've got a yoga mat i've got a skipping rope and i've got a hula hoop <laughs> ah. i'm ready to go uh, i just I, I i definitely have to talk to you about um getting the routine right yeah so if someone sure. was listening uh, and watching this right now which i'm sure there will be people who will uh, what's your number one tip uh, for motivation? To, you know, people are at home, they don't know what to do, they, you know, don't know what's best. How do you get people motivated? A great question. Um, I think one is to think of what you like to do and start with that. Like, do something that's fun. And if it's, if you like stretching, do that. If you like Playing tennis, do that. Um, like, just do something that's active. And okay, so we can't play tennis right now. Let's just say, maybe you can. You remember stuff from gym class? Maybe jump, jumping jacks. Do jumping jacks. Do a minute of jumping jacks. If your heart's not up for a minute, do thirty seconds. And then notice, like, you might be really fatigued that first day. Um, your your brain might be like, stop, stop, stop. But commit to doing it again the second day, and notice how you can go a little bit further. And then maybe once you keep adding, 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 you start to notice a change in your body. Um, you know, we didn't talk about the depths of my transition, but right now I weigh 198. Um, when I left Florida, I weighed 230 pounds. Um, I had acid reflux from my bad diet. 
um, I had been very athletic in New York, but when I went to Florida, I just was like, like I said, this like parachute, like that yeah. get me out of that life. And I remember playing tennis with a guy. I was in my early to mid forties. He was in his mid fifties, and I thought he was the only person I could find online. I didn't know him well, and I thought, oh, this is the place to start. I'm just gonna play with this old guy and tear him up, you know, and. I showed up and he said, I ate pizza last night, man, so forgive me if I'm slow. This 55 year old dude who was hung over on pizza just wiped me up on the court. I was so out of breath. <laughs> I was like, the tennis ball would be over there and he'd have another tennis ball to start the next point. And I would stall and get the tennis ball that he didn't need just to give myself oh, more time. Oh, just to give yourself more time. <laughs> and he so, thought he was being slow, my goodness. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the point being, um, I remember what it was like when I came back here and I, I first ran and I was like, I can't believe how out of breath I am and I can't believe how out of shape I am. And, and then what happened was paying attention day by day. So what I'm saying for people to do, I lived that. I didn't, I wasn't always in shape. Most of my life I was, but I know what it's like to get it back. And I know what it's like to pay attention. And to, some people say, don't get a scale. For me, it worked to get a scale. Mm. It worked for me to see every day, like, Oh, if I ate chicken wings last night, the scale is like, you ate chicken wings last night. Yeah. If I ate a salad last night, the scale is like, there's less of you today because you ate a salad last night, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then movement the same way. Like if you, if you, you know, you don't have to do a hundred pushups every day because that'll lead to injury. But if you do things to maintain your joints and your joint health and build your strength, you will notice a difference at all ages. You will notice a difference, even if it's just like if you're at the desk all the time and you start doing neck circles instead of just sitting hunched over for two hours. So back to the original answer, do something to start, notice how it feels, give yourself a little bit of time, you know, commit to it, set an alarm to it, and then do it, do it daily for a little bit of while, a little bit of time. And then once you notice the changes, I believe it'll start to snowball into more and more positive aspects. Yeah, it does, because I often find that when I haven't exercised for a while, you know, life takes over, you get out of the way of it. And I know it's not <coughs> excuses, it kind of is. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you just, you don't prioritize it, is what I'm saying. And then um, you do get back into it. And every single person says this, who exercises and exercises right, they say, why was I not doing that? <laughs> yeah. What am I doing that? It's like it's part of the human condition, and that we all, at the time of getting the dopamine and the serotonin and all the good happy hormones and the oxytocin from the hugs, and mm -hmm. even like you know, giving yourself a hug in those situations give you so much, but yet we let it go so quickly, mm -hmm. and then getting it back is so hard and then when we do get it back we realize just how much it gives us so much but yet mm -hmm. we didn't do it. and it's it's this kind of everyone nearly everyone apart from the likes of yourself who are representatives of you know doing it properly consistently and continuity is key but most mm -hmm. people dip in dip out i mean that's what keeps the likes of you in business is people's mm -hmm. ups and downs um, yeah you know, ins and outs of the, you know, and it, it's the truth because you're the sort of person that they need to channel back into what it is that's needed. Um, and that, that's brilliant. That, you know, we all would just love to have a personal trainer every day. Mm. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm happy to help. And, uh, and the thing is sometimes when people let's say they practice consistently for four months and then they miss a month and they come back and they're like, ah, oh, I can't believe I lost so much. I'm like, today you're back. Like just focus on today. Forget about what happened before, you know, it's or a really, you really good attitude, Keith. It really is. And you know, at the end of the day, if people are in search of purpose when it comes to exercise and getting them into a space where they're able to do it, you're the man for the job. And I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out to be on my podcast today uh, in search of purpose. And uh, you know, have a great day. Keep doing what you're doing. And obviously it's paying off. Yeah, will do. And thank, great to be in touch with you again. Uh, I'm impressed by your work as well. I look forward to learning lots and lots more about who you are today and tomorrow. And uh, thank you for having me on your show. Thank you. Great, Keith, thank you.